there a creature just outside of our world who hides in the shadows, who lives in our swamps, forests, and mountains? Does it exist? Where did it come from? Find out on the Revelation 13 podcast. Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. A uh, good-sized man or something that looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right there. Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. There I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, and the seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads and a blasphemous name. Welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hopley. Uh, what you just heard was a legitimate 9-11 call in the early 90s from Washington State of a gentleman who uh, saw a what we would term as a Bigfoot. Today's episode is going to focus on the studying of the Bigfoot mystery. <clears throat> what do we have in the way of evidence that these things exist? Well, of course, that call notwithstanding... Uh, there have been footprints and hair samples collected throughout the years. There have been historical accounts written uh, and uh, sightings, eyewitness sightings. And we have photos, film, and recorded sounds. But the American par pu public <clears throat> started to become aware of this creature um, in 1958. Bluff Creek, California in August 27, construction workers clearing a timber road found 16-inch footprints around the bulldozer that they had been using. And then later in that year, on October 1st and 2nd, uh, the footprints reappeared and returned. Um, this time they were able to make casts, and the story ran in the papers, and they took pictures and it ran in the papers. And it started uh, uh, an interest and people to find the creature because about this time what there had been the reports of the abominable snowman so that had enlightened some people as to the possibility of an upright walking ape in uh, mountain or forest regions of the United States potentially but uh, in the end they really weren't very many and by the time 1967 rolled around not a whole lot was found. I mean, you, they, used to, they still have footprints and, and sightings by humans over the years, like there basically always has been, until the Roger Patterson film. And then, for the first time, the American public got to see a seemingly legitimate film of what had been reported by people for years, and in some, in some cases, hundreds of years. On our first landing in the New World, we came across these horribly ugly monsters. They were hairy and swarthy, with great black eyes. Leif Erikson, 986 AD. Leif Erikson was a Viking explorer who was blown off course while going to Greenland. He discovered America in 986 AD. And they were, but they were unable to maintain a permanent settlement because of the Indians and the conditions in uh, Canada. The, uh, the, their actions, though, were recorded in the saga of Eric the Red. 
and this report was generally discarded by science until relatively recently when proof for the settlement was found. In 1840, Elkaniah Walker, a missionary to the Spokane Indians, wrote about the creature. Bear with me if I trouble you with a little of their superstition. They believe in a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. This mountain is covered with perpetual snow. They inhabit its top. They hunt and do all their work at night. They are men stealers. They come to the people's lodges at night when the people are asleep, and they take them and put them under their skins and to their place of abode without ever waking. Their track is a foot and a half long. They steal salmon from the Indian nets and eat them raw, as bears do. If the people are awake, they always know when they are coming very near by their strong smell, which is most intolerable. It is not that uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles and then the stones will begin to hit their houses. Elkaniah Walker, 1840. In 1847, Paul Kane, an early American sketch artist, also wrote about what the Indians had told him of the creatures near Mount St. Helens. Because interestingly enough, uh, Elkaniah Walker referenced a, mount, a certain mountain to the west, and one of the mountains to the west was Mount St. Helens. So here's Paul Kane's account from 1847. Now Mount St. Helens was never frequented by whites or Indians, who assert it's inhabited by a race of beings of a different species who are cannibals and whom they hold in great dread. Paul Kane, 1847. Years later, at Mount St. Helens, in 1924, a small group of miners encountered the creatures. During the summer of 1924, a group of us was prospecting for gold. One of our men shot a giant hairy beast while hunting deer, and the body toppled over the canyon rim and disappeared into a foaming torrent far below. That night, in our cabin, we were bombarded with enormous rocks and the walls assaulted by foul-smelling, shrieking wild creatures. The attack continued until daylight. After the creatures withdrew, we fled and never returned to retrieve our belongings. Thereafter, the location has been called a canyon. The activity in that area persisted until the eruption of Mount St. Helens in the 80s. Harry Truman, not the former president, an old man who lived on the mountain and died in the eruption of Mount St. Helens, uh, uh, reported seeing the creatures. The importance of these accounts are, not that, are that that they occurred before Bigfoot fever hit America in the late 60s and into the 70s. These people were not looking for monsters. The accounts of Bigfoot are not just limited to the Pacific Northwest. They have been, there have been sightings all over America and Canada through the years. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, our former president, uh, wrote in his book, The Wilderness Hunter, about two fur trappers in the 1860s who went on a beaver hunt in the remote and mountainous Salmon River area. One evening we returned to find our campsite in shambles. We attributed it to a bear. But at midnight we were awakened by some noises. Immediately we smelled a strong odor. I could see the shape of its body in the shadows. I grabbed my rifle and fired. We could hear it run into the woods. The next night we kept a large bonfire to keep it away, and we took turns watching for the beast. At dawn we decided to leave. I went to fetch the traps while my partner stayed to break camp. When I came back, my partner was dead. His neck was broken, and there were teeth marks in his throat. I jumped on my horse, and I didn't stop until I found safe refuge. Michigan, 1977, September 18th, issue of the Citizens Patriot, had the story of Becky and Bob Kurtz. They lived on land.